Muy bien, bienvenidos al ciclo especializado de formación, trabajo, salud y estrés organizado por ARL Sura con la colaboración de PRAX, el Grupo de Investigación Estrés y Salud de la Universidad de los Andes y el Centro de Epidemiología Social. Este ciclo de formación especializado tiene cuatro ejes temáticos, diez conferencias, nueve expertos de cuatro países diferentes y quince de horas de formación especializadas. Tenemos el placer de contar con 1.586 participantes correspondientes a 747 empresas eh, de 114 actividades económicas y esperamos que con el conocimiento que vamos a compartir en este ciclo de formación, esos 746 empresas a través de los 1.586 participantes impacten positivamente, mejorando condiciones laborales de más de 626.000 trabajadores que tenemos el potencial de impactar positivamente con los conocimientos que se desarrollen en el transcurso de este ciclo de formación. Recuerden que este ciclo tiene la posibilidad de eh, tener traducción en simultáneo para nuestros conferencistas internacionales. Si usted lo desea, puede escuchar la conferencia de nuestros invitados en el idioma original, que en este caso es inglés, o en su defecto, activar la traducción simultánea. La traducción simultánea la puede activar con un icono de traducción que encuentra en la pantalla, en la parte inferior derecha, de su computador, ahí seleccione esa opción y le va a aparecer un listado desplegable. Allí, por favor, si desea escuchar en español la traducción, seleccione la opción español. En caso contrario, no seleccione nada y escuchará la conferencia en el idioma original. Durante el evento, usted puede participar, tiene dos opciones para hacerlo, para compartir cualquier tipo de comentario, apreciación, reacción frente a lo que estamos eh, conversando durante el evento, por favor utilice la opción de chat. Para hacer preguntas a nuestro invitado, utilice la opción de preguntas y respuestas. Esta opción debe ser utilizada exclusivamente para las preguntas que vamos a escalarle a nuestro invitado al finalizar la hora de su presentación. Mi colega, la doctora Viola Gómez, va a estar revisando y va a estar eh, recogiendo las preguntas que ustedes hacen a través de la sección de preguntas y respuestas y en los últimos 30 minutos de este evento va a escalarlas a nuestro invitado del día de hoy. La asistencia va a ser tomada en cualquier momento del evento mediante un formulario que va a encontrar publicado en el chat. A quien asista a todo el ciclo se le entregará un certificado especial de participación y a quien participe en algunas conferencias un certificado por cada una que serán enviados al correo electrónico de cada participante una semana después de haber finalizado la última conferencia. Adicionalmente, algunas horas después de finalizado cada evento podrá ver, comentar y compartir las conferencias en la página de memorias del ciclo de formación. Allí mismo podrá diligenciar la asistencia si no alcanzó a hacerlo durante el evento. No siendo más, le doy la palabra a mi colega, la doctora Viviola Gómez, directora del Grupo de Investigación Estrés y Salud de la Universidad de los Andes y líder de la propuesta pedagógica que eh, tenemos el placer de compartirles con ustedes el día de hoy para que presente a nuestro invitado. Viviola, tienes la palabra. Viviola, te escuchamos. Ya estoy ya estaba activando aquí mi micrófono. Bueno, buenos días a todos. Eh, para mí es un honor y un placer presentarles al profesor Robert Karasek, de quien ustedes probablemente han oído cosas o han usado algunos de sus conocimientos o materiales, porque su modelo de demanda control es uno de los, si no el más importante, utilizado en la investigación mundial para investigar, para entender el estrés laboral y las consecuencias de, de este estrés en, en la salud de las personas. El profesor Karasek ha sido muy amable y muy gentil en aceptar esta invitación para presentarnos su modelo, los orígenes de su modelo, e incluso espero que tengamos unos minutos al final para que él nos cuente un poco cómo está evolucionando su modelo porque claro, en la medida en que el, 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 las condiciones de trabajo y el, el sitio de trabajo y el mundo ha ido cambiando, también van cambiando las condiciones que nos pueden afectar, que pueden generar estrés. Y el doctor Karasek ha venido trabajando en identificar algunas de esas condiciones y en ver cómo logramos captarlas y medirlas para poder hacer algo con ellas. De manera que, no siendo más, le damos la palabra al profesor Robert Karasek. 
Professor Carcer, welcome. You, you can share your screen now. Okay, so I press the screen share. Yes, sir. And, okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna open my PowerPoint. Yes, sir. Professor, do you, you, you can share your screen with, in, with the bottom chair in the bottom of your screen. Uh, okay, did it not uh, share? It's not no. yet shared. Okay, so, but anyway, I'm moving into the, the presentation mode here, um, but uh, somehow is it, uh, so I'm not shared, uh, this is, let me see. Um, okay, there we go. There's the share. Yeah. Yes, sir. Now we can see your presentation. Okay. So now uh, okay. let's see if we're on the presentation mode here. Perfect. Okay. Yes. You can you can click there in the presentation yeah. mode. Okay. That's right. Great. We can see your presentation. Thank you. Okay. Are you ready? Yes, sir. We are ready. Whoops, all right, let me begin. Uh, uh, first by saying, well, it's a great honor to have the opportunity to communicate with you all on these very important topics. These, of course, occupational health topics, but they have to do with our psychosocial work environment, which has become more and more and more important as we find there are challenges uh, with our physical environment. And of course, work and the economy are very central issues to each person and each company, each society, each economy. And so, but we're finding over the last several decades that uh, new understandings are needed. And it's sometimes hard to come to grips with the softer side of our work and economy. But that is the specific purpose of the demand control model, to conceptualize in an understandable way uh, the organization of work and its psychosocial issues. And uh, in order to do this, of course, we have to uh, be able to uh, understand the nature of work organization, the way uh, companies and the way individuals themselves would organize work. And the very beginning of this uh, process, which um, is of course, we've had decades and decades worth of people investigating the issues of these psychological reactions and back centuries, uh, but trying to conceptualize exactly what the effects are uh, in a very complex economy now, where we have not only people who are working in their jobs and complex organizations, but in fact, in which these organizations are working in a complex global economy. But let's begin at the beginning. And what we're going to do, therefore, is start with a very simple model, the demand control model. And I'm going to try to explain this to you now. And um, as I do this, I want to say that the demand control model was actually first, uh, it, it had its focus in both activation, motivation, how people become active in their, uh, in their society, in their life, in relation to the work, and also how work is a pressure and a stress and a cause and a contributor to chronic disease. And of course, that is the side that's important for the occupational health focus that we have today. But I think I should make it clear that the kinds of health outcomes that we were originally uh, interested in had to do with, I'm going to go back uh, there, we're talking about chronic diseases. Um, these are not uh, initially life-threatening, and they're the product of sophisticated human organizational decision-making. Now, uh, the model that you can see uh, that we just looked at here has uh, yeah, a very important set of linkages 
to a work organization in that uh, whenever you think of work, it has to have a, a clear goal. The organization will have a goal and that gets translated then into the demands for individual workers, people at the workplace. They contribute to um, the organization meeting its goal, but that puts demands on them individually. And that you can see on this um, back here uh, in this uh, dimension, uh, top psychological demands, you can see it being high or you can see it being low. And then at the same time, this work has to be organized. It has to be coordinated. Individuals have to work together. So there has to be some sort of coordination and control. So the individuals will either experience that in terms of having a lot of control or little control. And that's the vertical dimension of this diagram. Now I'm gonna go through the dimensions of this diagram more in just a, in a few extra slides. But what we're trying to capture here, therefore, is the organization of work, both its demands and the way in which it's organized. Those are very, very central issues but they are sort of social and psychological. There are, of course, physical demands that are central to very, very, very many occupations. But right now, we're gonna be focusing on the, what you might call the mental demands primarily. So now what I'd like to do is to take uh, this model, and I'm gonna mention that, as you can see, there are two very uh, obvious <laughs> diagonals here, one in, uh, uh, with a little blue label there, this one, active learning, and then there's another one down here with a red light label, job strain, illness risk. Now, of course, for occupational health and safety, this is the one which is going to be most central. Um, so let's now go forward, and I'm going to uh, uh, go sort of step by step through the parts of this uh, model. Now, the first diagonal that you saw, uh, or the second one actually, the one uh, uh, coming down to the red box, um, tries to make the point that our first hypothesis is that demands in either life or at work, these are kind of unavoidable. If you did nothing at all, you wouldn't be alive. <laughs> so, but the problem is, do you have some control over these demands? Can you sort of optimize your own performance or can you avoid very difficult situations or can you possibly uh, seize on the possibility of great opportunities? So the issue of whether you have some control over the demands of life is gonna be a, a very important theme. Therefore, the first hypothesis you see on the screen, hypothesis number one, is called the job strain hypothesis. And it suggests, uh, it states that the most adverse reactions to strain, these are of course the occupational health central issues have to do not only with fatigue, anxiety, depression, and the physical illnesses, uh, but also a whole variety of long-term chronic diseases that are increased in their risk um, and really long-term consequences. But those are hypothesized to occur when the demands of the job, those that you just saw back on this diagram, are high and the worker's decision latitude is low. Now that's only one of these four boxes. And if this occurs for a long enough time through increasing for example, sympathetic adrenal arousal of our physiological systems, are, uh, it decreases some of the healthier physio physiological processes. And over a very, very long term, it makes it very hard to coordinate our physiological reactions. And we find ourselves in a situation of high strain. And the question um, is basically, that of chronic exposure to the situation of high psychological demands at work then and very little opportunity to control those, either in terms of 
uh, simple uh, decision making on when and where and how, but also how to do things, what skills to use. And so the, our first hypothesis is this diagonal here, high psychological strain. And this is the one that has, uh, in fact, been, uh, you know, it's been out in the world now for 40 or 50 years. <laughs> it's been used by lots of researchers. And uh, it, it's, uh, it has the advantage of being uh, quite simple. It's been tested in many ways and found to be very useful. And at the same time, of course, it's a, it, it's a simplification. But as we um, sort of try to understand the complexity of the social organization of work, we have to start someplace simple. So, so we're, we're, we're happy to begin in a simple place. Now, what kind of jobs are we really talking about? Well, an obvious one would be the assembly line worker. Uh, you can think of uh, Charlie Chaplin in a, in a sort of a comic film where the um, items keep rolling down the assembly line and there is no opportunity for the worker to decide how or when to apply the psychological arousal that's necessary to do the job. Therefore, there's a, um, in a sense, the individual can't really optimize his or her internal physiological processes. It's the assembly line that gets optimized. So that's not necessarily good for individual health. Now, you can imagine that um, another job might be uh, not necessarily directly controlled by the machine. Um, in the case of uh, people who are processing clothing, for example, garment workers, they would have heavy deadline pressures where within uh, the next uh, 35 minutes, they're supposed to produce you know, 528 new pairs of socks or something like that. Um, and therefore, there is going to be an intense kind of time pressure and the tools and working or organizing principles are not really an option that they have. Uh, they might want to do things in a different way. They might decide, well, I wanna work really, really hard in the morning and not very hard after lunch. Uh, but it can very often be true that the organization's time scheduling or other rules don't allow that option. So, uh, we have those kinds of difficulties. Now let's just go back again to talk about the high strain situation we just outlined. And so we might be talking like, like assembly line workers, garment stitchers, also if, uh, waiters in, in, this, uh, in a restaurant where many, many, many orders are coming at, at uh, lunchtime or dinner time, something yeah. like that. Um, and so I'm going to go back to some of these other jobs um, a little bit uh, later in, in, in the talk. Uh, but so now let's uh, go to talk a little bit about the, uh, the dimension that is the control dimension. Now, let's see, can we see my, I hope you can see my whole slide. I can see that some of my screen is being blocked by uh, videos. Can you see the tops and uh, can you see my whole slide? Yes. Uh, yes, sir. We can see oh, it. Okay. So you can see this, this title. And so the, the title here uh, is that, let me go back, just really unfortunately, uh, going forward here. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to go back. It's, uh, whoops. Now, let's see, how did we get out of the uh, full screen here? Uh, Professor, uh, looks like you activate um, simultaneous um, closed caption. You can unactivate it with the um, option you use, just press. Yeah, uh, I don't know how I did that. Uh, actually, I'm trying to go backwards here a little bit. And I think next to the pencil, there is an option. I believe that is going to unactivate. Uh, I think. This, this one? I think, yes. Yes, that seems to have done it. OK, well, okay. Um, I'm actually trying to go back a couple slides here. Here we go. Now, so the issue here for the important control dimension. And this is, of course, 
how work is organized in all of our uh, complex organizations, uh, we have a special way of measuring it in the demand control model. And we call this skill discretion because, or decision latitude, because actually it's this measure of control reflects the fact that uh, in organizations, control often is distributed to people with high levels of knowledge or experience, and those individuals may be given authority. So knowledge, high levels of knowledge often legitimate use or having control in organizations. Um, and therefore, we're going to be talking about a combination of control and skill use when we use the measure called decision latitude in the demand control model. Now, one thing I'd like to make clear is that this model is talking about how an individual worker is perceiving his or her work situation. That is, we're talking about the control that the worker has over his or her work activity. Now that means um, we're not taking the view right at the moment for our discussion here of, uh, let's say, you know, a higher level management talking about control. We're talking about the worker's perception of control. And in that context, um, we can see that there is both a side of that, which is called decision authority, and these are the opportunities that um, the worker has to make decisions about how to do the job, when to do the job, who to do the job work with, all kinds of decisions about how to use the energy that every individual has to use to get the job done. Then the next component relates to the skill that has to be used. And that reflects the fact that it's really hard to separate um, issues relating to use of skill and control in, work in a work organization context. So because they're so theoretically linked and because they're empirically so close, we lump them together into a single measure called decision latitude. They are combined and that's the measure you saw on that original diagram as the vertical axis. Um, so in measuring decision, uh, these two components, for example, in terms of decision authority, uh, we're going to be talking about how to do the work, how to perform the work. Uh, in terms of skill discretion, we're going to be asking questions about, can you learn new things? Can you use high level of skills? Can you develop and use your skills? Do you have opportunities for creativity? Do you have opportunities for variety or is, is your job very repetitive? Um, and these are questions, for example, that we use in the job content questionnaire. We're gonna be talking about that a little bit later, a new version of that a little bit later. So that's how we measure this. I, I'm, I, I would actually go back just, well, I'm not gonna go back, I'm gonna go forward here. Um, and mentioned that the second, that dimension across the top of the original diagram, the demand control diagram, um, is uh, called psychological demands. So the reason we call it psychological demands is we're talking about mental workload here. Certainly many, many jobs have physical demands, you know, farming, all sorts of construction labor, many, many jobs are physically demanding. We're not measuring those precisely in the context of this model. What we're measuring more is the mental arousal. Now the mental arousal, of course, is necessary to do physical work as well. There's no question about that. But some, some of the office jobs that we have, for example, don't have as much physical work, not enough in fact, but uh, the mental arousal is what we're talking primarily about. So how hard you work, how many deadlines, how much coordination, do you have uh, conflicting demands? Uh, and this uh, scale is, um, is something that we 
will um, assess, for example, by questions such as how hard do you work? How fast? Uh, how many deadlines? Do you have enough time to get the job done? Uh, do we have conflicting demands coming from different directions? And we're talking again about mental demands. Um, sometimes we have added in some of our research work uh, questions about uh, concentration, intensity, interruptions, and waiting on others, but not always. Uh, we, we tend to work on the intensity of the mental workload arousal and also its, its duration and the possibility for pauses and rest uh, or the lack thereof, obviously. So uh, those are the two primary dimensions. Now I'm gonna go back so we don't completely uh, lose track of talk about our second uh, hypothesis here that has to do with an entirely different situation, entirely different. We're going to be talking about positive outcomes. I've just been talking about assembly line work, strain, long-term illness, things like that don't sound good at all. But if we think about our lives, we could hardly have an interesting, exciting life without being active. And we could hardly be active without being intense, intensely mentally engaged. So high levels of arousal can be part of positive experience as well. What's the difference then between these high risk jobs that we just talked about? The difference is control. Control becomes entirely central in the demand control model, and in fact, in its future expansions as well, as we're going to see a little bit later. Now, so what we call work when the demands are high, but when the individual has opportunities to make decisions about how to do the job, what skills to use, we call this active work. So this is the active work hypothesis. I think what's kind of amazing is that means that we can talk about demanding work, but some aspects of what we might need are, could actually be positive. They could be challenges. The difference is, the distinction is based on how much control you have over how to use, utilize the energy that you have to arouse uh, in order to get, uh, to you know, either get the, your goals and the job done, or the organization's goals accomplished. So in the case of active work, you have a lot of opportunity and that leads to very, that can lead to very positive outcomes, can lead to motivation and new skill development. So let's go a little further here. Uh, let me say that um, if we go sort of on the other end of this dimension that we just looked at, we can be talking about situations which instead of being giving you a lot of control, maybe they have high demands, but what about the opposite? What if you actually have little control? But by contrast to little control with many demands, what if you have few demands? there's essentially nothing you can do. You're prevented from doing very much. You may have to sit at your desk and, and, and do nothing but appear to be busy or doing busy work, which is not really um, engaging, but nevertheless is controlling your alternative options for further activity. Uh, whoops, we're going in the wrong direction here. So in that context, we might be seeing people learning to be essentially helpless. Uh, they're not able to use the skills that they have. And the demands of the work organization may not be great. It may be, in fact, restrictive. So what we can see is that type of um, outcome also can occur along this second dimension of activation and motivation, either active work or passive work. Uh, so then let's go one more step and imagine, well, what would happen if we went up here 
Uh, is there low strain work? Well, what can we say about that? Actually, um, of course, it sounds very relaxing. You could just be sitting out in the sun or sitting in the rain <laughs> and not doing anything. But of course, we don't really want to not do anything with our lives. Um, so if in fact there is nothing to be done at all, it's not actually a highly desirable situation. But in terms of the demand control model, it's what we call the sort of zero point. Um, and uh, but we don't very often use that as the uh, we use that as basically the reference point for many of our uh, studies. So let's go then forward and take a sort of a summary look at some of the implications of what we've just been talking about. If we look at that model that we just talked about, we first talked about these negative consequences of high demands, low control. Um, and we can talk about that as job stray. Well, what if that accumulates over a long period of time? Oh, doesn't sound good, that's for sure. Ah, we can also think about the opposite. What if you have very, well, you have a job, the, the demands are significant, but they're not overwhelming. It's kind of challenging work and it gives you the opportunity to decide how to move forward, how to learn, how to accumulate new skills. And you have active learning opportunities. What about the accumulation of those over time? Well, that sounds good. You could become, yeah, uh, terrifically skilled in, in this area or in that area or another area. So we can look at the overall time accumulation of these effects. And I think the point I'd like to make with this slide is that if we think about these positive effects of having challenges that we're able to manage, that are sort of under our control and allow us to learn and develop, and we think about the result of those over time, we can use those as coping skills to reduce the negative effects of job strain. That would be great. Wow. So there are some long-term positive implications of the demand control model in that respect. But not everything is necessarily sunny and happy and positive. What if we look at the opposite dynamic effect? Suppose you have a lot of job strain and you have a day after day, year after year, and after a long period of time, of course, uh, well, we have the risk of chronic diseases, but in addition to that, what happens is that when you are in the context at work where you're confronting a possible desirable challenge, you might say, ah, oh, I'm too overwhelmed. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to back out. I just can't handle anything more. I'm just too overall stressed out. So I quit. Well, that means you're not going to get these learning opportunities. So overall, what we say is that learning over the long period of time in the psychosocial work environment can reduce the effects of job strain. On the other hand, accumulation of anxiety over long periods of time, job stress accumulated over time is very likely to make it difficult for you to learn and go forward and develop in your work activity and in, in your career, either for yourself or for the organization. So those are some long-term effects. Now, let's go to some other implications and some other very important um, uh, additional implications uh, or not implications. There are necessary complements of the dimensions of demands and decision latitude that I just mentioned. What about social support? What about social interaction? This is, of course, entirely important. What about the social context? We have to go into that. We haven't talked about it, but social support is a very uh, important additional concept that's often added to the demand control model, creating what's called the demand control support model. And we just saw the work of Jeff Johnson and Ellen Hall, who talked about the development of ISO strain. Well, the social support, of course, could come from the supervisor or it could come from coworkers. Uh, now, this kind of support that we could have 
could either be what we call inter instrumental support. Somebody's helping you solving a problem that you're having at your job. It could be a coworker or it could be a supervisor. Or it could be a kind of emotional kind of coping support where you can share your problems with someone. You can sort of share the burdens. Um, and of course, uh, we can also think of the issue of this happening in the context of a, of, a, of a team or a group where the impacts of these psychosocial working conditions are, of course, mediated by the social structure. Here, one of these uh, mentioned, uh, measured uh, a great deal by Jeff Johnson is called collective control. Now, let's go forward a little bit. Uh, what I'd like to mention at this time, I think, is that the overall impact of these of the health risks here is really quite significant. Uh, when we talk about psychological strain, I, I don't not going to be able to go in this slide in detail, but we can see the impacts of um, mental strain and depression. We might be talking in many uh, societies, for example, in the Netherlands, Netherlands, where they measured the, measured this a great deal. Also in Scandinavia, where they're able to measure this a great deal. We're talking about thirty percent. 35% of these negative mood affective problems being associated with mental strain at work, for example. And um, the difficulty here, uh, and then muscular skeletal disorders, uh, disorders perhaps 20, 25%, cardiovascular disorders, here we have to listen a bit more to Peter. Um, we're, we're, we've been doing work on this for a long time. We can see that at least 10% of cardiovascular risk and maybe much more uh, and of course, now we're talking about our risk for uh, chronic disease and um, our, you know, pan, pan epidemic exposures, our immune systems, things like that. Um, they are also significant percentages. Uh, I'm not going to be able, I think, to go into these particular detailed issues very much more than to say that what we have here is we can see a study, whoops, in, in Sweden that registration of long-term disability, those are very expensive costs for the society. These are very much higher for my job strain work. And this is a, a, a register study over a 12 year period of time for the uh, using national register data in Sweden. But one of the issues here is that People who go on disability in this way, when they go, you know, they have er take early retirement, something like that. These are problems that are going to be affecting them, uh, not just for two years or three years or two months or six weeks, but for many, many, many years. One of the difficulties with the psychological strain exposures, as it was found in the Netherlands, is that it's 35% uh, of these exposures um, uh, just, well, uh, very many people are not able to recover. Uh, they are simply permanently disabled when they initially register for mental strain disability in, in, in the Netherlands, large percentages. And, uh, so I think one of the difficulties with the illness component or the illness outcomes that are associated with psychological strain is that they're not easy to reverse. It's not just like an ankle sprain. Um, it's something that leads to more permanent transformation of capabilities, in this case, mental coping capabilities. So they're really long-term costs. Now, I'm going to talk about a few issues relating to measurement with the demand control model here. Um, and where you're going to use a, an instrument called the job content questionnaire. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit first about occupations. Just like to say that, uh, let's go here to, uh, here's an occupational map. Now, what are we looking at here? We're looking at the demand control model, that four box model. But now what we have done is we have split the workforce into let's say 500 or 1000 occupations. And we have tried to ask in surveys about the 
average job characteristic scores that are reported on these questionnaires in terms of psychological demands, how hard they work, or in terms of decision latitude, whether you have skills or that you can use in creative work, whether you're able to um, you know, have variety or decide how to um, decide how to use your skills, that would be decision latitude. And then we plot occupations. We can find we have waitresses and we have uh, we have garment stitchers, we have assembly line workers. They're in this high demand, low control quadrant. And I think one thing, I'm gonna go back just a slide here that we saw that's pretty interesting is that um, let's talk about executive stress and management stress. Well, of course, there is a lot of stress in being a manager, but one of the positive coping possibilities is that you can often make decisions about how to do the job, when to do the job, one alternative or another alternative. So that helps moderate the impact of some of the higher occupational levels stress exposure. However, lower status workers don't have that opportunity. Um, so, but if there's a problem with executive stress and we have many workers at low levels with not enough decision um, opportunities, well, we should somehow figure out a way of more equal sharing of decision power and avoiding some of the secondary adverse consequences of rigid hierarchy. Uh, here, I'm going to pass over the slide, I think, a little bit quickly. But what I'd like to say is what we're seeing when we look at this, now we're looking at the psychological demand, high, low. We're looking at control or decision latitude, high, low. We're looking at the demand control model, but we've made as the vertical dimension rewards such as income or other status or education. What we find is that when we're looking at job strain, we're picking up an aspect of the negative side of our occupational structure, which is almost not measured in statistics which capture income or education or social status. Those in fact do increase as you go and get more and more active work, your income goes up and so on and so forth. But for many people, and when we look at our statistical findings, we are missing in our health registries, the impact of psychological job strain if we only look, for example, alternatively at income or education. This is really an orthogonal dimension of risk. And I think that's important for uh, people who are using epidemiological databases, for example. Now, I'm going to go forward. And uh, there's some limitations, uh, of course, using occupation for stress. Um, I think I'll uh, skip over this a little bit. Um, measurements of, for example, these aspects of work, psychosocial aspects of work, uh, can be either self-reported in questionnaires, and in fact, that's the easiest thing to do because some of the data can only be uh, gathered by asking an individual, what's your job like? Now, alternatively, we can add to that, we can look at the means of groups of workers. And so individual you know, preferences or, different, or differences can sort of be averaged out. You could get the idea of what a particular kind of work is like. That's you know a group mean or even an occupational mean. Uh, then down here we have, well, you can't see this very well. This is a, a matrix where you would try to infer the nature of a person's psychosocial risk by just asking what is their job. Are you a, a waiter, a waitress? Are you an assembly line worker or uh, something like that? Um, so there are different ways we can be measuring these. Now, I think one of the important points is that here we can see with some of the um, uh, measures of what we call control, what we, uh, we call it decision latitude, it has to do with control at work and skill, that there is a lot of agreement between these different measurement methods. Uh, point correlations of 0 0.7, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.6, 0 0.5. That's very good. So we have good 
measurement of validity across different methods. However, that's less true for psychological demands. That would imply there's a lot more either individual difference or there is perhaps more variation in work because the occupational specification is not quite, uh, quite as tightly determined in the case of psychological demands as it is in the case of decisional attitude, which can come from, uh, you know, you get a job on the basis of your, uh, your, your education, for example, at, at you know, one level or another level. So uh, some of these measures, psychosocial measures, are quite reliable across different methods, those involving skill and control and physical demands, others involving, for example, social support, psychological uh, demands, um, those uh, are challenging to measure in a reliable way, but it's possible. It just provides us more measurement challenges. And another, uh, I'd like to make an important comment here. We don't want to overlook that. Uh, there's a gender difference in many uh, countries uh, in terms of male and female exposures to job strain. And this is often because males can have higher levels of control at the workplace. And that means they're more likely to be able to use their decision latitude to cope with some of the psychological demands. So women can often have jobs that have high demands, uh, but not as much control and that can put them at risk for greater psychological strain at work. Not always, it depends obviously on the, on the particular circumstance, but it can happen, something to think about. Now, another thing to think about, and this is a very surprising thing, uh, we're not gonna go in detail, but if we take something like the job, content questionnaire and its scales, and we look at national surveys, and we look at, different countries, different parts of the world. We look at the United States, we look at Canada, we look at the Netherlands, we look at Japan, we look at many different countries and we ask to find out what the average score in a nationally representative sample would be in these countries. One of the things that surprised me the most when I did this research was to find out that there's a lot of similarity between countries uh, on some of their scores on these measures of skill, even in psychological demands. So in other words, we have a global economy we're dealing with. There's homogeneity, as of course there are phenomenal differences and divergence across countries as well. And both of those are dynamic processes and we have to understand um, these um, uh, tabulations were from uh, the 19, uh, late 70s and early 80s and uh, early 90s. Uh, so things are changing. Things are changing a lot. And that brings us to some of the newer issues <laughs> of uh, how should we go forward with something like the demand control model? Well, first of all, I'd like to mention that we have to measure. We're, we need to be able to measure things when we go into the psychosocial work environment. Now there's something we have used called the job content questionnaire. And I talked about some of its dimensions. Uh, now we're going to move to a new level. And one of the reasons we're moving to the new level is because the world's changing. And it used to be true that uh, companies provided fairly rigid and stable job uh, characteristic or, or job conditions and labor markets were national. But all of a sudden that's changing. We're not the 1970s, we're you know, 50 years later and the current psychosocial work environment requires new tools therefore. So the questionnaires we've been using need to be supplemented. Uh, these task effects, they're very, very important because they're proximal to the health outcomes and motivation outcomes. But we now need to understand organization level and those aspects of the social structure immediately outside of the workplace that have to do with job security or with work to family linkages or things like that that mediate the impact of the task risks on the outcomes that are either health outcomes or well being outcomes. So we have a new generation of psychosocial challenges. We have to have a new set of instruments. And 
whereas originally we were talking about motivation and skills and stress and burnout, now we have to be able to go to lots of much more complex issues that require multi-level theory and multi-level measurement. So in addition to measuring the job task as we have measured with the job content questionnaire, we have to be able to measure the organization level issues and we have to measure issues that are external to the workplace as well. And that such as um, the link to the labor market, which is going to be very important in terms of job security or job insecurity. So these are what we uh, classify as external to work, social, structural issues that affect how the job leads to health outcomes or to well-being outcomes. So now in our new version of the, there's a new instrument out, it's called the job content questionnaire number two, and we retain the narrative that I just outlined for you relating to demands, psychological demands, control, decisional attitude, uh, social support, we retain that, but we extend its generality by measuring across levels. And we have tested this actually now in pilot studies in four countries, both in uh, Western uh, societies and also in Eastern societies. Uh, and so we, we really have um, a significant um, step that we can um, offer in terms of the next level of measurement. And let's think about what decision latitude would mean at that level. What would decision latitude mean? What does that kind of control represent? It means the freedom to act using your repertoire of skills within the social structures which you have, where you have made your investments and where you get your major life-sustaining rewards. That's a very much broader definition, but that's the one that's gonna be important as we go forward into the future when we're understanding the psychosocial effects of work because they are so multi-level now. Um, and we have tested the job content questionnaire number two, JCQ2, in four countries. Uh, that's Korea and China and Australia and Germany. We found support for the hypotheses. Now, you, <laughs> fortunately, in the audience, can find out and you can reserve. Uh, actually, the job content questionnaire will, uh, number two would be, should be available in three or four months. You can just check on the web, the jcqcenter.com, and you can come in and find out about how to reserve the job content questionnaire to in the future. Now, about the future, let's really talk about some future issues that are important because I think if we go back, we can certainly see that a model that captured the psychosocial work environment in 1970 in these stable work situations in companies and national labor markets could easily fail to capture all of the challenges that we are facing today. And therefore, we have to deal with creative coordination, communication, organizational complexity, participative decision making, fairness, social capital, but also, of course, what about climate sustainability. What are we going to do in our world with all of these environmental challenges and economic inequality and diversity? We have to deal with these large challenges now. It's not possible to really think about the impact of the psychosocial work environment without addressing those if we're trying to figure out how to organize work and economy in the future. So now it just so happens that if we take the active work aspect of the demand control model and think about the fact that active work is really related to skill development, let's think about creating an entire economy which is based on human skill development and creative social coordination. And what would be important about that? We call this incidentally conducive economy. What would be important? Well, skills and development 
these are really central for our future social, economic well-being, particularly if we need to protect the environment, if we need to reduce the number of physical resources that we you know, mine in the earth or transform or manufacture, if we need to reduce that, and if we need to reduce physical energy demands, coal and oil, and, and even environmentally safe energy demands, we can do that if we can find an alternative economic pathway, an environmentally friendly one. And we have that in the extension of active work, skill development dimension. If we just take that active work and we take it all the way up to the level of economic and social organization, we can make an economy on the basis of that. One of the reasons is that a skill is its own motor to drive economic processes. Skills need to be used, and collectively. If you have a skill, you want to use it. If you can play the piano, you want to play the piano. You need to play the piano. If you're a carpenter, you need to work with a plumber, and you need to work with an electrician. So this is a motor for a new direction in an economy. And so, um, this is going to be different from our classical economy, and it's, it's going to be a marginal pathway because our, uh, our, we're never going to get rid of our physical economy. We're always going to have that. But the question is not do we get rid of that. The question is, where should we go on that new part of the pathway that we need for new economic development? And the aspects of the extended demand control called the associations demand control model offer a systems model of formulation for the conducive economy. And here are some of the issues that are gonna be central in that new model. First of all, systems can grow. They develop higher levels of complexity. Well, that's good. We want our companies, we want you know, our families, we want our educations <laughs> to develop higher levels of sophistication and complexity. The opposite can happen also at a systemic level. We can lose the opportunities to have uh, and support complex response. And um, of course, ultimately, in the context of physiological risks, this becomes equivalent to a definition of chronic disease risk, losing uh, what you might call capacities to handle uh, the challenges of our, our environment. We can't handle as many. We can't handle them as long. We get more easily overwhelmed. We decline in our um, um, capacity to handle complexity. Uh, and of course, that's the, the, the essence of long-term chronic disease. Now, another aspect of the, this expanded demand control model where we generalize the notion of demands and we generalize the notion of control is that there's gonna be a socially creative side of this, socially creative human development. We need to be able to sustain our social development on the basis of what you might call creative, socially you know, identity building and social cohesion building, social relationships. And those are going to be part of what we call the associationist demand control model. So if we think about our simple market economy, and we think of the fact that, well, we work you know, day to day and we input our labor and we get wages back and we use those wages to buy things. And of course, the you know, companies will produce things that we buy on the market. That's what we know as our economy. But if we go forward, as I'm saying we must do, and we have a pathway into the future, which also thinks about a skill developing pathway for economic growth, then we have a conducive value economy. The commodity economy, it's always gonna be there, but we need to grow the new side. And I think what's interesting is we can see that that has a foundation in some of the very psychosocial 
factors that we are investigating in the demand control model. And there is certainly a lot of big issues here. So what do we do? This is so much of a, a need to find a future for sustainability for all these other issues. Well, we're going to have to have some new kinds of exploration. How about some conferences where we try to think about, whoops, uh, we try to think both about the fact that we must be productive and effective in society, in our organization. We have to get things done. We have to make cars. We have to make food. We have to make healthcare. We have to make those things. At the same time, we need well being, individual well being, creative growth, and also reducing risk of illness. So we need to investigate combinations of these productivity and health outcomes in new ways and new forms of social and psychological work organization. We actually attempted successfully to do this in a conference several years ago organized by a colleague of mine called the Week LaRouche at the University of Bordeaux. And we handled issues such as youth, work, and employment dynamics, aging workforce, managing companies in an accommodation of in an economy of innovation and health uh, and, and, and stress risk. And what are the political economic implications here? Well, so that is where we have come to. We've got a lot of new questions out there. Okay, thank you very much. Professor, it was a pleasure to hear your lecture. Thank you very much. Now we are going to go in our session of uh, questions and answer, Viviola. You're welcome. Can you please turn on your camera? Sí. La cámara está encendida, ¿me ve? Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay, profesor, profesor Karate. Tengo Yes. Voy a decirlas en español para que eh, Laura las pueda traducir. Tengo algunas preguntas que son más de tipo teórico sobre el modelo, algunas preguntas que se refieren a evaluación o medición y algunas sobre intervención. Voy a empezar por las preguntas más teóricas sobre el modelo, sobre la concepción misma de estrés laboral. Hay una pregunta eh, que suelo yo, es una pregunta mía, eh, porque me suelo encontrar muchas veces personas que dicen si el active job, el trabajo activo, se da porque las personas tienen muchas demandas, y el control es un protector, pues no importa darle más demandas a las personas, le podemos dar más control, más control, más control. Es como si pensaran que es ilimitado, se le puede dar mucho control a las personas y como que no importa si le damos más y más demandas. Mi pregunta es, allí debe haber un límite, supongo, de que en un momento dado demasiadas bueno, demandas, sí. así haya mucho control, termina siendo similar a job strain? Well, I think that uh, that's a very good question. And I have simply gone through the model too quickly. And I have sort of not given enough of the qualifying uh, limitations of some of these dimensions in trying to cover a lot of, uh, a lot of issues. And certainly, uh, the qualification would be the demands of work can be high, but not overwhelming. And there simply are limitations. And there's no way that high levels of skill or high level of control can possibly uh, compensate, uh, or social relations for that matter, uh, for extremely high levels. So um, what we're talking about when we see this four box model are what you might call relative differences between occupations. So the answer is, no, we can't handle a really extremely high levels of mental demands, and of course, not physical demands, obviously. OK, gracias. Um, hay una persona que pregunta si la remuneración es una demanda o cómo juega la remuneración un papel en el estrés laboral. Well, I think this is a very important question. And in particular, uh, Johannes Segrist has, has focused very much on the issue of how, uh, well, there are obviously two issues. You know, the first issue is, uh, do you, are you rewarded enough that you can handle the basic necessities of life and, and your family needs? And are you rewarded in such a way that you can uh, 
you know, prosper in terms of the material needs that you have. What we're talking about when we're looking at these psychological demands are things that, uh, well, uh, they, in some sense, I, I don't know want, want to say that they're less fundamental than the need to eat or the need to sleep uh, or the need to have a family. However, those basic physical needs must be uh, satisfied and those are satisfied in the commodity market economy, the regular market economy, and you need to be paid as a platform. But if there is that platform, then the next question is where do we go also from there? So um, uh, in some way you can say that physical well-being and physical rewards and monetary rewards are sort of a basic platform for some of the psychological well-being issues. But Johannes Segrist, of course, talks about this in another way in terms of your feeling of uh, relative status and fairness. Are you being fairly rewarded? And uh, I, I'm not going to repeat Johannes' message. I think he's, he's pre presented that. It's fine. And I, I, I do agree with that also. And when we go to the JCQ2 and look at the organization level, we also include those issues of fairness and relative reward. Gracias. Um, la siguiente pregunta dice, ¿qué tan sensible es el modelo de manda control a la dinámica empresarial que experimentamos hoy en día en un mundo tan cambiante, cuando el aprendizaje adquirido en un momento se vuelve obsoleto en el corto plazo por la dinámica del cambio tecnológico? Yes, well, this is, uh, this is a very Im important question because these changes are much uh, more rapidly occurring than they were uh, occurring when we first conceptualized the demand control model. However, there are some basic issues relating to skill that have to do uh, whether you're in the process, I mean, whether you have some control with respect to the process of learning and whether this is a development that is rewarding for you in some way. Uh, for example, uh, it may be that some of the skills you have to, to learn uh, are related to making good uh, social linkages to people who are users and customers or that could be your neighbors or other people in your community and that may be a, a, a positive thing. Um, however, if you don't get those kinds of reward, increasing um, very, very rapid uh, learning um, <clears throat> requirements to learn, well, they can be a demand of them themselves. Now, I think, uh, you know, the issue again is, do you have some control over the process of the speed at which you learn? the way in which you are able to use the results of this learning. Does this you know, accrue to you also, uh, or is this only accrue to someone who's employed you, for example? Um, so I think that uh, it's a very good question. It's a, it requires a pretty complex set of answers. Okay. Um, la siguiente es más un comentario, más que una pregunta. Porque la persona dice, es muy interesante lo que el profesor Karasek nos expone. Creo que uno de los factores que contribuyen a esto es la competitividad laboral que nos lleva a todos estos problemas de productividad y estrés alto. Uh, I'm not sure that, uh, is there a question here? Uh, no, no. It's a comment. Oh, okay. It's a commentario. Okay. Um, aquí hay una pregunta. In, in, the, in, the, in the context of the French yes. conference uh, on the new economy of healthy and innovative work, we found that for the participants, we needed to address both of these work organization questions simultaneously. And what was interesting is we had combined sessions and we looked at both of these outcomes simultaneously and well participants were able to do that and they found that this made sense out of the discussion that they were engaging in. Ok. Una persona afirma, algunos estudios dicen que el estrés laboral en un cierto nivel es bueno, 
cómo reconocer cuándo es dañino o saludable o perjudicial para las personas y las empresas. Yes. Well, what we have been doing, that's, you know, of course, a tough question. Uh, what we have been doing is a lot of epidemiological research at a high level, for example, looking at national samples or other samples that could be occupational samples, you know, several hundred people or several thousand people. So we're looking at mean values, uh, averages. And when we use such large sample, we're able to make linkages to important chronic diseases, for example, heart disease or high blood pressure or other you know, outcomes that are uh, well-recognized chronic disease outcomes, uh, outcomes measured by the medical, uh, medical community. And then we can certainly say, well, at a certain cutoff point mathematically on our scales, we can see the risk goes up here and the risk goes up there and so on and so forth. We can see that in a very large sample. But of course, the individual experiences his or her own sets of limitations. And these have to do with, well, work and family issues. They have to do with other aspects of the work. Where are they in their career? What is their age? And so on and so forth. So in other words, um, I think it's important that the demand control model has supported the epidemiological research that allows us to develop cut points when we have national samples. We can say, mm -hmm. well, if you're at this particular level on this particular scale, the risk has increased to 30% for a certain kind of um, coronary heart disease, for example. We can say that, but it's only for very large samples. So this is an, an important for public health decisions. But when it comes down to the company level, well, of course, human relations and occupational health and safety, people have to be able to factor in the specific mm -hmm. situations that apply to their company. But I think Peter Schnall would certainly say that without these um, scales nationally uh, supported, nationally measured and national health samples, uh, we wouldn't have been able to have any understanding of where those boundaries were. So we can be happy that the demand control model has allowed us to at least make mm -hmm. some kinds of estimates because these are otherwise what you might call soft aspects of our modern life. And they're not so easy to measure, but mm -hmm. they certainly have big effects. Mm -hmm. um, hay dos personas que comentan eh, que en muchos procesos de selección de cargos se mide la tolerancia a la frustración o la capacidad de trabajar bajo presión o la capacidad de resistir muchas demandas. Y las personas opinan que esto no debería ser así, que no se debería seleccionar a las personas por su capacidad de trabajar bajo presión. ¿Qué opina usted sobre eso? Yes, I, I think that that's absolutely true. I think that absolutely should not be a uh, <clears throat> job uh, selection requirement. Uh, I'm not sure how easily it could really be measured, but I, I, I think the mistake there is that uh, it would allow companies to press further and further and higher and higher their overall level of demands, hoping that they can select super super performers, and, and but what about the rest of the population? We have to keep the whole society functioning. And those are the kinds of dialogues that of course been, have been appropriate for what you might call the conducive economy or this mm -hmm. associationalist demand control model, which goes many levels up to the level of the global economy. We need to keep the whole society working, not just a few super people. Mm -hmm. Um, una persona pregunta que cómo aplicar el modelo con los millennials que tienen una nueva forma de ver el mundo. Él dice, el JCQ model se desarrolló para otra generación y yo creo que se requiere mirar o estudiar esa nueva forma de entender el mundo de los millennials. Well, um, I mean, this is an important potential question. Uh, what we have to have is some precision. What are the specific issues? And, and I think some of the very important issues that are, well, what's the future for our planet? Of course, we have to have sustainability. We have 
a huge set of challenges that have to do with um, the internet and communication and interlinkage and the potential loss of our individuality as we go into mass communication or we can sort of uh, communicate with someone else you know on the you know on twitter or something like that and find a huge number of unexpected responses or something like that but these are things um these are challenges that need to be formulated i, I think it's it's quite possible that they will lead to new analytic forms. The issue is we have to evolve and develop them, and we're probably going to have to involve, evolve and development, develop them out um, as a development of some of the models we have, because many of these issues are kind of cross-generational. People start at one part of their you know, life cycle, and then they move to another part of their life cycle. So, um, that's a you know it's a, a a big set of challenges you're proposing we just need to uh, spend some time i think figuring out how would though how would those changes be defined mm -hmm. okay gracias um las siguientes preguntas son sobre medición evaluación um una pregunta una persona pregunta cómo medir de forma objetiva las demandas de empleados de oficina, pero hay otra pregunta relacionada que pregunta sobre diferentes métodos para medir y cómo sería la mejor forma de medir en una organización que tiene personas con diferentes roles, diferentes edades. Es decir, es un poco la pregunta sobre cómo medir las demandas y el control en diferentes cargos, en diferentes roles, en diferentes edades. Well, um, what we have used is the job content questionnaire, and we have been able to develop scales which we could uh, check uh, against national standards in national surveys. So we were able to ask these, uh, we were able to uh, you know, support companies who wanted to ask and uh, use these questionnaires in their companies, and then compare the results of the scores on the company's response scales to the national survey response scale. So that's the, uh, the job content questionnaire, some of its scales of uh, psychological demands, it's two scales of indecision latitude, it also has some scales of, well, it has social support, supervisor support, job insecurity, physical demands, but now it will also have organizational level measures, and those can be applied as well. They can have to do with psychosocial safety climate, they can have to do with fairness, they can have to do with organizational chaos, or what we call con conducive communication, uh, procedural justice, those can be organizational level things. So we have questionnaires, what we have to do is we have to find large samples that are representative and use those to standardize the questionnaires, then we can apply those very same questions inside companies and we can find answers, not always that are perfectly relevant for individuals precisely, but which may be relevant for groups of individuals who have the same kind of work in, in the company. We have to recognize that none of the questionnaires that we have used, that I have used, uh, would be actually very precise in assessing the job characteristics in an objective way of a single worker. They would be relevant, however, if you have groups of workers and you wanted to compare the psychological work characteristics of two different groups of workers, then you know you can evaluate the statistical validity of that comparison. So we're using scales which we have validated in national samples. And in the context of the JCQ2, we have run surveys in Korea and in China and in Australia and in Germany and with 16,000 people and to try to validate the scales and to come up with national means. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of work to do mm -hmm. and we have to realize that these scales are still useful primarily at the group level, mm -hmm. not so much at the individual. Mm -hmm. Hay dos preguntas que son a mi juicio muy importantes. Eh, están muy relacionadas. Una persona dice, 
Este modelo claramente está relacionado con la forma o diseño del trabajo. ¿Cuál es el mejor camino para lograr cambios en este tema? ¿Quién lo debe liderar? ¿Las personas que hacen el trabajo? ¿El líder? ¿Gestión humana? ¿Todos a la vez? Y una pregunta relacionada dice, me gustaría preguntarle al profesor acerca de las intervenciones cuando solo se centran en las personas. Si se ha investigado que el riesgo es más alto cuando se traslada la gestión, responsabilidad a las personas, y no hay una gestión estructural de las empresas, es decir, en el diseño del trabajo. Yes, well, I think that uh, the last point that you made is really, uh, is really an important point. When we talk about the demand control model, it was really conceived in the context of work redesign. That is work redesign, not, that's not personality redesign. It's redesign of social organizational structures. So the idea is to find organizational structures. Now these that, that somehow solve two separate challenges, they have to, solve the problem of individual health, well-being, and development on the one side, and also there's an organization that has to exist in a national or a global economy on the other side. So when we come to the JCQ2, we put these together at the mid-level, most people would call it the organization level, but the organizations have multiple you know, structures. We call these platforms of dynamic stability because they have input from worker well-being coming up from the top to the middle, and from the middle, from the central organization, from the somehow center of the organization, the company has to organize a response that can work out in the global economy. They have to meet in the middle. So there has to be a platform of communication where collective worker you know, uh, needs for both creative uh, and healthy work environments can be sort of linked together uh, and uh, with the requirements that the company has for you know, surviving in a competitive world. So we have called these mid-levels, as many people would simply call it the organization level, we're calling them platforms of dynamic stability because they're an important extension of what has been simply a task level model, but which needs to be expanded now because there are very few contexts that can avoid the multiple bottom-up, top-down effects that mm -hmm. are involved sí, in es, work redesign. Es una pregunta que seguramente hacen profesor Karasek porque en Colombia como en otras partes del mundo las intervenciones se suelen centrar en enseñarle al trabajador coping, habilidades de eh, coping para que puedan manejar el tiempo, para que puedan manejar su estrés, etcétera, y por eso es eh, que se hace esta pregunta. Pero aquí hay una pregunta que, con la cual podemos tal vez cerrar, porque la pregunta es, ¿cómo se logra concientizar a la alta gerencia de que al estrés se le debe dar la importancia que merece? Usualmente solo se piden resultados, pero el impacto que tiene el estrés y la ansiedad en los colaboradores de la organización no suele ser importante. Well, of course, obviously, um, if there are, uh, th there needs to be a, a high level discussion. We have to have discussions on, we'd like to praise this um, <clears throat> uh, the platform, Sebastian, Viviola, and all, Peter, uh, for developing the high level discussions that are needed to support a Really, it's, it's a, actually a political dialogue that has to occur in governments that have to say, well, when we talk about worker well-being, and that is the point of having our government and our economy, if we talk about worker well-being, we have to look at its psychosocial side as well. How do we, how do we measure that? How do we evaluate it? We certainly can't put the burden of uh, doing that on the individual loan. And if we avoid that, what we wind up with is we wind up with an economy that has much higher levels of disability. It has chronic disease, it has dropout, it has strange, unexplainable political processes. Um, all of the things that uh, we are talking about in terms of the psychosocial work environment have many, many side effects. and. If one is a manager only looking at a financial, um, you know, 
a financial report, one can miss those, but at a, a community level or at a political level or at an international conference level, that's where one has to develop the dialogues to support these all, you know, these support for these psychosocial interventions. Uh, and then that information has to be communicated to managers and the forums have to be developed where that linkage occurs. That was one of the advantages of the uh, University of Bordeaux conference. We had managers there as well as occupational health and safety representatives. That's what's needed. We have to bring both into the same, um, into the same dialogue arena because obviously the productivity outcomes are one kind of psychosocial outcomes. The health and well-being outcomes are another kind and they have to be viewed simultaneously and jointly in our modern world. Mm -hmm. Professor Karasek, muchísimas gracias. No, no voy a leer algunas preguntas y este es un comentario para los participantes porque se refieren a, a preguntas muy específicas de tipo de intervenciones para cosas muy específicas. Yo les recuerdo que en una de las conferencias que tendremos más adelante vamos a hacer eh, conferencias específicas para intervenciones, de manera que yo creo que sería el lugar más apropiado para preguntar cómo poder intervenir en ciertos aspectos muy particulares o cómo evaluar. También tendremos una sesión sobre todo de evaluación en particular en Colombia, donde hay una legislación que regula la forma como debemos evaluar los factores psicosociales. Profesor Karasek, yo por ahora quiero repetirle de nuevo mi gran agradecimiento por haber aceptado nuestra invitación, por estar disponible a estas horas. Sabemos que usted está en este momento acabando el día, eh, de manera que es, es un momento difícil para usted, pero de verdad muchísimas gracias de parte de todos los colombianos que estuvimos aquí disfrutando de su presentación. Well, thank you for this opportunity, and don't, don't forget the jcqcenter.com, because that's where you'll be able to find information coming in the future, both about new measurements and these uh, some of the theories that I had to go through a little bit quickly, and of course, these great questions. But the opportunity, uh, th this exposure, and I think what's really important is your social dialogue there. I think that's a, a, a great um, a social contribution that you're all collectively making. I would really like to uh, um, thank you all for contributing to it. That's a, a great thing. Okay. That you thank were you. doing. Thank, thank you. Thank you and have a good evening. Professor, thank you very much. Muchas gracias a todos ustedes thank por you. participar yeah. del ciclo especializado de formación, trabajo, salud y estrés llevado a cabo por Sura en colaboración con Prax, el Grupo de Investigación Estrés y Salud de la Universidad de Los Andes y el Centro de Epidemiología Social. Recuerden que tenemos una nueva conferencia con el doctor Peter Schall el próximo viernes de nuevo a las 10 y 45 a.m. Los esperamos en el próximo evento. Que tengan todos un feliz día.